Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name's Ruth Maisie and I'm Programme Head of Primary and Early Secondary Education at the Nuffield Foundation. It's really brilliant to see so many people have been able to join us today to hear about uh, and discuss a range of research uh, that we've funded on, on reading. Um, as well as everyone here, I think we have I mean, possibly approaching 100 people um, who are signed up to attend online. So a warm welcome to our online audience, as well as to everybody in the room. Um, it should be a great morning, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentations and chairing the panel discussion later. Um, I'd like to turn now to the substantive part of my introduction. Um, firstly, for those of you who are less familiar with the Nuffield Foundation, um, the Foundation is uh, an independent charitable trust. Uh, we aim to fund research that informs social policy, primarily in education, welfare and justice. Uh, we believe uh, that robust and relevant evidence has the power to change lives and increase opportunity, especially for people experiencing disadvantage. Uh, the Nuffield Foundation has a long-standing interest in how children learn to read because reading is widely recognised as important to broader educational attainment. For instance, <clears throat> students are less able to learn other curricula if they've not developed sufficient reading skills. And in addition, the impacts of reading are far reaching in terms of later outcomes like income, uh, but also in terms of things like mental well-being. Despite the importance and benefits of reading in the academic year 2021-2022, 25% of pupils in key stage two did not meet the expected standard. Obviously a range of challenges uh, underpin uh, underpin that, uh, mainly relating to, or many relate to children's um, early environment, where government policy regarding the welfare state has a large part to play. However, schools have a significant role to play too in addressing and mitigating the effects of inequality. And we hope that the research we funded can inform that endeavor. So the work we'll hear about today uh, focuses on different aspects of learning to read. We'll firstly hear from Dr. Hannah Nash from the University of Leeds, who will talk about her work identifying children at risk of reading disorder. We'll then hear from Laura Shapiro from Aston University on how reading ability and practice influence vocabulary. Um, after a short break, uh, Dr. Sarah McGowan from the University of Edinburgh will tell us about her work, co-designing an intervention to improve reading motivation. And then finally, Dr. Maria Cockerell and Dr. Joanne O'Keefe from Queen's University Belfast will present their evaluation of an intervention to improve reading comprehension in early secondary. Um, we'll close with a panel discussion where bringing researchers and practitioners, policymakers together, we hope to get a, a broader view of promising approaches to improving reading attainment, uh, the gaps in our knowledge and how knowledge can be effectively translated into practice. Um, so uh, I think we better crack on. Um, and so I will hand over to Hannah, who's going to kick us off. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll have to make sure I go the right way. Um, good morning, everyone. So nice to see lots of familiar faces here. I'd like to thank Ruth for inviting um, me to talk to you about the DART project today. Uh, the DART project is um, a trial of dynamic assessment. It's the first, I guess, trial in a UK context. It's not a solo endeavour, so um, there's a big team of people involved. Um, Paula Clark is here today, and so is Emily Oxley. In fact, Chris, Emily and Katie were the busiest people. They did most of the work on the project. So, um, as Ruth has already said, we know that 25% of primary children leave school unable to read as well as we would like them to. So, I'm sure I don't have to convince you of the need for early screening, which enables early identification. But the question that we're interested in is how should we carry out that screening? So typically, um, static or traditional screeners measure what a child knows at a particular point in time. And these tend to be in areas that are related to reading. They're predictive of later reading success, such as letter sound knowledge or vocabulary knowledge. But then on the converse side of that is dynamic assessment. So instead of looking at what, child know, what children know at a certain point in time, we're interested in what children are able to learn, what's their learning potential. And to do that, we can administer a task that involves feeding or teach back and look to see what a child is able to do using that teaching or feedback. So why should we measure learning potential, particularly in the UK context? Well, we know that opportunities to learn 
The skills that are really uh, important for later reading vary between children. If we think of children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds or children uh, for whom English is an additional language. Um, because their opportunities to learn um, vary, this will affect their performance on traditional static screeners. So if we measure their learning potential, we're potentially reducing the impact of those environmental learning inequalities. So it's a potentially fairer method of assessing um, or screening for later reading difficulties. Another issue is that sometimes static assessments, measures of things like letter sound knowledge, can be too difficult when children first start school. And if a task is too difficult, lots of children don't do very well on it and it can't differentiate between children. And of course, dyslexia is a disorder of learning to read, so why not assess learning itself? And it's really important to understand why children are having difficulty learning to read and potentially separate those children who have an underlying learning disorder from those children who've had less opportunity to learn because um, they will require different support and intervention in school. Okay, so. This is just really to set the scene for what we're looking at in the project. Um, it's a really brief overview of learning to read in an alphabetic language such as English. Of course, we start in the beginning with decoding. And we know that key skills for sounding out words include phonological awareness and letter sound knowledge. But of course, English is made much harder to learn because we have lots of exception words like meringue. They can't be fully sounded out, so children can struggle to read them. But research evidence has shown that they're read using a combination of partial sounding out and vocabulary knowledge. Of course, children can't continue sounding out words because they wouldn't make much progress in learning to read. So they need to create what are called orthographic representations. And this allows them to recognize words by sight and enables fluent reading. And of course, the end goal of reading is to understand the author's message. And there are some really important skills in reading comprehension, not just word reading and accuracy, um, but oral language skills, including vocabulary and grammar, and then higher language skills such as inference or inferencing or comprehension monitoring. For the purposes of our project, we've been looking at two types of reading difficulties. So children can either um, have a sort of dyslexic reading profile or a poor comprehender reading profile, or they can have a combination of the two. So dyslexic readers uh, tend to be inaccurate or slow, particularly in terms of word reading. Um, and that's thought predominantly to be caused by a phonological deficit. Poor comprehenders are, on the other hand, tend to read well, but struggle to understand what they're reading. And lots of evidence have shown weaknesses in oral language, particularly in vocabulary knowledge. And that's really important for what's coming later on in my talk. So we have reviewed the existing evidence on the use of dynamic assessment. This evidence tend to come, tends to come from um, the US or from Denmark. There's not much evidence in the UK context. But we conducted two systematic reviews. The first looking at how well dynamic assessments can identify children who have reading difficulties. And the second looking at how well they can predict growth in reading over time. And essentially, Dynamic assessments of decoding and phonological awareness tend to be good at identifying children uh, who go on to have later reading difficulties, and they also predict growth in reading over time. As part of the systematic reviews, we identified that dynamic assessment can be time consuming to administer um, and a bit tricky, so there's some room to make that easier, and the way we've done that is to computerise our tasks. Um, there's not a lot of research looking at children from diverse backgrounds, so children who are bilingual or have English as a second language. And there's no research really looking at the identification of children with reading comprehension problems. It tends to focus on word reading accuracy. So the aims and overview of the DART project itself. Well, our work was divided into three work packages, and we're looking at three different aspects of reading. So we have decoding in young children in reception, and then we have sight word learning and vocabulary learning in children in key stage two. So all three work packages follow the same longitudinal design. We have the first time point where we measure the reading outcomes. We administer our dynamic measure, and I'll tell you about a couple of those in a few slides time. And we also include traditional um, 
static predictors of reading for children of that age and some demographic variables such as socioeconomic status. At time two, we only go back and administer the reading tests that are used to categorise children um, as to whether or not they're experiencing reading difficulty. So, of course, we had some research questions. I'm going to focus on two of them today. Um, does learning in each dynamic task predict growth in reading over time? And can they accurately screen for later reading difficulties? I'm also going to focus just on two dynamic assessments, partly due to time constraints. Um, that will be the decoding and vocabulary learning, but also because they show the best potential as screeners for later reading difficulties. Okay, so I'm going to start with decoding. So this is a task that we used with children, firstly, when they were in reception. So we worked with children, um, over 300 children, um, at the first time point, then we went back 10 months later to assess them at time two. Reading outcomes here include measures of early word reading. Traditional predictors include phonological awareness, letter sound knowledge, rapid naming, vocabulary and nonverbal ability. Um, and then we have our dynamic assessment of decoding, which I'll, I'll talk to you a bit more about on the next slide. When we went back at time two, we identified 47 children who were in the lowest 15% of the sample in terms of their single word reading ability. And we considered to be those who are the poor readers who show the dyslexic profile. So here's our dynamic task. It's not very dynamic here because it's just a series of pictures. But essentially, we're trying to teach children the sounds for three novel symbols. We have s, m, and o. There's an initial presentation, and then children receive training during trials where they're shown the symbol and have to recall the sound. Um, there is a maximum of 30 trials, but children can reach criterion and end that phase early. Then we go through um, some training, blending the two sounds together. That also has feedback. And really, I guess the post-test or the outcome measure is their ability to read nonsense words that are written in these symbols. Um, so I'm sure you've already all worked that out, that that says um, so, so. And it's framed um, as a narrative around a crocodile, Chompy Croc uh, and the Sacred Stone. Chompy Croc has got to crack a code. It's written in these weird symbols. It's all run on a computer. Um, but the researcher controls children's progress because they have to log whether or not what the children have said is correct or not. OK, so to address the first research question, we're looking at growth in reading over time. So here we're controlling for reading at time one. And we've also entered all of the other predictors. So the static measures, including phonological awareness, letter sound knowledge um, and socioeconomic status as well. And what we see is that our dynamic assessment of decoding post-test scores, so um, those reading and um, blending scores, predict an additional 6% of unique variance in word reading growth over time. Now, because we're interested in um, our sample of children who have English as an additional language, as a group who, for whom dynamic assessment might be particularly useful, we've conducted lots of our analyses separately for these two groups. And what we see here is that whether or not the children are monolingual or have English as an additional language, the decoding post-test scores still predict unique variance in growth in reading. How is the task in terms of a screener for later reading difficulties? So we identified 47 children um, as being at risk of developing the dyslexic reading profile, 23 monolingual children, 24 children with English as an additional language. And just to tell you a little bit about what some of these numbers are for people um, who aren't familiar with them, sensitivity refers to the number of children identified by the screener as being at risk who later go on to have reading difficulties. Um, specificity is the number of children who are identified as normal readers who weren't picked up by the screener. An area, um, area under the curve takes both of those values together to work out how accurate the screener is at identifying children. Um, so all of those values range from zero to one, with zero being not accurate and one being um, perfect. So here I'm presenting some data for the whole sample. And what we can see is that if we look at the dynamic assessment on its own, it's a really accurate screener for later reading difficulties. But if we take two of the static predictors together, that's um, word reading at time one and letter sound knowledge, they're also a really accurate screener of later reading difficulties. And when you add the dynamic task to those static um, measures, you don't see any improvement in uh, screening accuracy. 
However, when you look separately at the monolingual and EAL groups, what we do see is that the dynamic assessment is a really sensitive screen of the later reading difficulties. In fact, it identifies all of the children who go on to have later reading difficulties. And when you add it together with those two static um, predictors, early word reading and less sound knowledge, you do see a significant, small but significant improvement in um, accuracy. So that was a sort of overview of the decoding work package. And now I'm going to move on to vocabulary. So here we're looking at children who were in year four at time one. They were in year six at time two. This was interrupted by COVID, which just resulted in a longer than anticipated gap between the first, uh, the first time point and the second time point. Here we're looking at two outcomes. We're looking at reading comprehension and vocabulary knowledge. The static predictors of reading comprehension include nonverbal ability, vocabulary, and reading accuracy. And then we have our dynamic assessment of vocabulary learning. Um, so at the second time point, we've identified 20 children as meeting or comprehend the profile. I know there's some discussion about what that profile is exactly, but here these are children who um, are more than one standard deviation low the sample in terms of their reading comprehension, and they also have at least a one standard deviation discrepancy between reading accuracy and reading comprehension. Okay, so this is the dynamic assessment of vocabulary learning. It's presented as a Galaxy Explorer quest. So um, Commander Stan McKenzie is on a mission to visit lots of planets and learn about um, aliens, such as Goni, who's a red bearded lazy alien. And so we're trying to teach them the name of the alien, also some semantic uh, information about them. So they're initially exposed to the alien, the name, what the alien looks like, the attributes, and then they undertake vocabulary training where they have to recall the name of the alien. And then they have to provide the um, definition. So they have to describe Goni. And also we administered a test of recall where they saw six aliens, three of which they had seen before, and they had to identify which alien was Goni. Because um, there's quite a lot of information there, we created two factor scores to represent the two different elements of vocabulary knowledge. So we've got the phonological aspects of vocabulary learning, and um, that's learning something about the names of the aliens, and then the semantic factor, which is children's knowledge about the aliens. Recognition was at ceiling, the children were too good, so we didn't include that. So what we found is that in the sample as a whole, the um, factor scores, so how well the children had learned that, that those elements of vocabulary about the aliens predicted additional variance in vocabulary growth over time. That was true for the monolingual children, the children with English as an additional language. In the sample as a whole, it also predicted some variance in reading comprehension, but here this is just about the semantic scores. So there's something about learning that semantic information about the aliens that's predicting um, differences between children in terms of their growth in reading comprehension. What's interesting here is that that's not true when we look just at the monolingual children, but it remains true for the children with English as an additional language. So how good is the task as a screener for uh, reading comprehension difficulties? Well, when we look at the sample as a whole, we see something that's quite similar to the decoding task, whereby the dynamic assessment is a really good screener, but it's not necessarily better than just measuring reading accuracy and reading comprehension 16 months earlier. But when we look at the two groups, we again see that it's doing something useful for the children who have English as an additional language. Again, we see a perfect level of sensitivity, so it's identifying all of those children who went on to become poor comprehenders. Okay, so just to sum up, both dynamic assessments predicted unique growth in reading ability, and that's after controlling for demographic factors and also skills that we know predict um, growth in those reading skills. Both um, assessments achieved an excellent or outstanding level of uh, classification accuracy and actually showed potential to add something to traditional screeners for children with English as an additional language. So we feel that we provided um, proof, of context, uh, proof of concept in the UK context. The computerized tasks have excellent accuracy and the potential to re reduce inequalities in assessment. But we now need to work with educators to establish how these tasks might fit in uh, with their existing practice, screening and monitoring. Um, 
what age children would benefit from completing these tasks when in the school year could they be administered and we also need to work with children to refine the presentation to make them um, a little bit more interactive and to reduce the time that they take to administer and to make sure that they're accessible for schools that they can be run on stable and low cost platforms okay, and those are my thank yous and I just want to thank you for listening thank you thank you very much Hannah um, has anybody got any questions uh, for Hannah Um, I wondered when you were looking at the difference between you were look, trying to predict reception children quite early on, if you were looking at all at how they're taught in the first year, because that must make a difference to the outcome um, later. So, um, <laughs> yes, I didn't have time to say this is conducted over seven schools in Leeds and they're quite diverse schools. We don't have a good flavour for differences in, in teaching. But one thing I will say in response to that, that, that kind of related, is that actually we did want to administer this task earlier in the school year. We've done some pilot work. Um, it's too difficult before Christmas, possibly too easy when we got to them in May. And I think there's a sort of sweet spot that's after Christmas. Um, and we know that because we did an analysis of non-readers. So these were children who really couldn't read very much at the first time point. And actually, the dynamic assessment really adds to the identification of those children. So if we could get to the children earlier, before um, they've really made that progress in reading, I think it, it would be even more beneficial. Um, but no, that's a, an excellent question about how they're taught and definitely something that we can build into hopefully the next phase of research when we're working more closely with the schools to see how it fits with what they're doing. We would thought of what they're doing in terms of assessment, but what they're doing in terms of teaching, I think. Is um, the reason I asked is, I don't know if you know about Marlene Grant's research, um, which isn't um it doesn't fit everything that you're supposed to have for research but it is very interesting um research which showed that the children who went through the teaching method at the end none of them were diagnosed as dyslexic so um and another bit of research in australia that was similar um so so of, of interest that. anyway <laughs> thank you thanks very much is there any um more questions in the room. Um, uh, Charles, so I've got another roaming mic coming. Um, Hannah, thanks. Um, the traditional objection to dynamic assessments, well, there are several, but one of the main ones is that they tend to be unreliable. What was the reliability of your dynamic measures? We have looked at um, the reliability of the tasks, and they tend to be quite high. I think they're in the, they're eight, the 80s, and that's something that I had been worried about and moving forward to try to reduce the amount of time they take possibly once you reduce the number of items particularly in the vocabulary learning but of course that comes then with a worry about reliability um, but I think in terms of their internal reliability they look okay okay you'll need to be careful if you reduce items because point eight is not that high to begin with so <laughs> it's just it's a real battle because that task is administered in two batches um, and I think to make it usable within schools it, you need to get the most value for your money so I think we need to look really carefully but we've already begun to analyze the two um, learning so it's two sets of three and we've analyzed them separately and actually just looking at three compared to six in terms of how they perform as screeners looks very similar but how reliable they are in terms of the two sets. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Um, Alice, do we have any questions from online? We don't yet, but um, if any of our online participants would like to put a question in, we we'll probably just about have time. OK, well, uh, we'll take maybe one more question from the audience um, in the meantime. And um, yes, lady at the front, please. Hi, Hannah. Um, it, it looks like a really beautiful test, but it, it seemed to me, although my eyesight might be tricking me, that when you get the higher sensitivity for the kids with EAL, the specificity drops. And I do think that has implications for schools. So I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, so it's interesting and it's kind of a trade off. So I've spoken about using them separately here and you're right, the dynamic assessments are really sensitive, but not necessarily very 
specific um, and you see something a little bit different for the traditional assessments, when you add them together, you improve both. But I think it's interesting because when we're thinking about where they might fit in terms of what schools are doing, is it something that you first before you start assessing other underlying skills, or is it something that you do after you've assessed those underlying skills? Um, could you use them on their own to identify children you think are having difficulties and then use some of the static measures to sort of narrow that pool of down way to do it? So use the task first and then explore um, their underlying skills. Yeah, no, it, that trade-off is, is really um, and important to us when we're thinking about whether they should be used on their own or in combination. Right, so, um, quickly, did, did we have any questions online, Alice? Um, otherwise, if, if we haven't, then we can, uh, I think we probably need to move on. We're getting some questions about how to submit a question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, hopefully oh, we'll crack. I have one, I have one now. Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, for one from Tammy Reese Frankfurt, which says, what is the advantage of using symbols for checking decoding compared to non-word reading? So, ASK is designed to be more like um, learning the alphabet. So, it's one stage below sounding out something like a non-word. So, and that's what we're asking children to do when they go into school. We're asking them to learn the alphabet. In an alphabetic orthography, once you have the alphabet, you should be able to read any word, but obviously that's not the case in English. But what we're trying to do is to teach them a new mini alphabet. Um, we're taking out what they might already know about the English alphabet that could have been influenced by their home learning environment. So it's one step below that. We're not necessarily teaching them to decode. We're teaching them a new mini alphabet that they can then use to um, decode. Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, Hannah. Um, can I please invite Laura to uh, uh, talk about her work now? Thank you very much. Hi, so I'm gonna be presenting um, our almost finished reading and vocabulary project, which is co-led with um, Professor Jesse Moore here today. Um, Five main sections. Um, I'm just going to start with context. So we're addressing two key concerns that have arisen um, from, from the education community. And the first concern is about limited vocabulary knowledge being a potential barrier to learning. Um, and so we're looking at how reading can be harnessed to promote vocabulary knowledge. Part of the reason for this is that we know vocabulary can be taught directly, but it's very, very time consuming. So if we can harness reading, children's independent reading, to enhance their vocabulary, that's, that's a low cost, um, potentially effective alternative. The second concern we're addressing is this perception of an academic decline as children move from primary to secondary school. But it's been quite widely reported that there's um, a view that um, from teachers that students' attainments when they enter secondary school are not what they expect, given how well they were doing at the end of year six, at the end of primary. And there's also evidence that there is actually a decline in terms of um, certain attainments. So what we're interested in is whether there is any, any real slowing of growth in certain core skills and knowledge. So why are we linking reading and vocabulary? So there are very well known um, importance of leisure reading. So we know from Kate Nation and colleagues' work that there's a very rich and diverse vocabulary that you can gain from books, from reading books. And um, so exposure to the written word is really, really important. It's much richer than the vocabulary you would get from spoken language. Secondly, um, our previous work, so this was um, this paper was led by Anna Cunningham, who's also here today. Um, our previous work shows the advantage of reading proficiency. So particularly proficient readers are better at learning new words. And so if you imagine being in a classroom and you're being taught about the difference between reflection and refraction, the better you are at reading, the better you are at distinguishing between those two new words, 
and the better you are at hanging meaning onto, onto those words. So we're also interested in a potential direct advantage of being a good reader and ability to pick up vocabulary. So there are three objectives to our project. First one is just to explore these relationships. So what is the relationship between leisure reading, reading proficiency, and vocabulary outcomes? Second objective is where we try and harness leisure reading to do promote vocabulary, more of an experimental objective. And then the third objective is where we're looking longitudinally at what happens during the transition from primary to secondary school. And is there any real sort of slump in children's um, basic skills and knowledge as they progress? And how does this vary for children um, from different SES backgrounds? Okay, so this is the methods for our first and last objectives, which use, um, which are based on a longitudinal study, the Aston Literacy Project, where we worked with 788 children when they started school. Um, these children are actually now, as we speak, just getting ready for their GCSE exams, which makes me feel terribly old now, having worked with them for so long. Um, the Nuffield Foundation funded us um, to examine these students as they transition from primary school. Um, key findings from the first objective. So this is where we were examining the relationship between reading proficiency, leisure reading, and vocabulary outcomes. I haven't shown you any fancy statistical models, but this is all based on um, a technique called causal, um, causal modeling, where we propose a model and we test um, how well that model fits the data and compare alternative models to the data. Um, our works, this paper is now published, um, and our key finding is that firstly, being more, a more proficient reader is linked to reading more in your spare time. So the, the better readers are spending more time reading at home. And that time spent reading is predictive of their vocabulary. And that root is, is the theoretical pattern that, um, that we know from the literature from Kate Nation's work and, and, it, and we support that, that pattern. We also find that on top of that, there's a direct advantage of reading proficiency. So as well as these proficient readers reading more books, they're also better at learning vocabulary. So there's something about being a good reader, being a proficient reader, and this is measured through reading efficiency tests. The more efficient readers are actually picking up more words. So there's a direct advantage as well. So it just really illustrates the power of reading for vocabulary. So that was the first objective. Um, the second objective is the one that um, was the most challenging for us. So it was, first of all, it was very challenging because the pandemic suddenly came in just after we'd recruited our first set of participants and got them screened and retested some of them. Um, and then we dropped it. And then the Nuffield Foundation kindly gave us an extension. So we were able to restart the project after the pandemic. And so we have another um, large sample, about 240 children in um, Greater London schools, and we've um, finished working with them now. We're close to writing up the, the, the final paper. And basically, these children, we, we screened, screened them to start with um, for, um, and selected the lower 50% of readers. We then pre-tested um, their knowledge of vocabulary we pre-tested their reading ability and then they um half of these children were randomly assigned to uh an intervention in which they set goals and they complete a reading diary and they get feedback on um perhaps the extent to which they are meeting their own goals that they've set and we worked with a company called gorilla to set up a really nice gamified intervention for them to them to do where they select the book that they're reading at the moment and select their goals and then they they keep us posted on their progress through that book um what was particularly um the reason we did it this particular way is that what we wanted to do is actually to track in real time what books they were reading 
And then Oxford University Press were able to give us the um, written electronic versions of those books. And so we could literally track what, how many times have they seen a particular word. So we could do a very direct um, mapping between exposure to the word and their vocabulary knowledge. So that was what we aimed to do. So the first the good news is that we found that in, even in this naturalistic design where we just hand out the books and we track what they're reading, we find that the quantity of leisure reading is linked to their vocabulary growth at an item level. So the word tempest, for example, is one of our items. Um, the more times they read the word tempest, the greater their vocabulary for that word. To a lay audience, this probably sounds quite obvious like obviously if you read the word more often you're going to get more knowledge of it but it was it was neat to be able to demonstrate this in a naturalistic in a naturalistic way so it really illustrates the power of reading for vocabulary knowledge however <laughs> the bad news is that even though we put so much effort into making this attractive we had workshops we invite, had campus experience days we got teenagers on board we showed them what we were doing got their feedback got them help to help us design this nice gamified thing we Got gorilla involved who are really techy and great at making it look beautiful and we had rewards in there and everything they didn't really like it i mean so they didn't <laughs> so only only a few of them really consistently did the diary so we've only got a very small sample who actually really engaged the intervention and so it's not it's it's not enough to um we still don't know how on earth to get lessons to read basically the answer <laughs> we know it's important but we don't know how to get them to actually do it um, so finally objective three um, this is going back to our longitudinal sample so um, so this is the sample that we've tracked throughout um, their time in school between primary and secondary school and what we're interested in here is whether there is something strange going on at the transition between primary to secondary school so there's a there's a Perception that attainments are some kind of a slump as they arrive into secondary school, but is this actually real? Um, this is our predicted. I've just shown you a graph of predict. See, so we predict some kind of flattening of growth as they go between year six and year seven transition. Um, and we can also check whether you still get you get the same slump over a normal summer holiday as well. So this is just prediction and we're also interested in whether this slowing of growth is exacerbated for children at lower SES um, from lower SES backgrounds so there is um, evidence that transition to secondary school is harder for children at lower SES backgrounds they experience a harder um, transition and so potentially there could be a greater slowing of growth for those children actually what we find is there's no slowing of growth if you measure everyday vocabulary so if we look at this is the um, british picture vocabulary scale um, vocabulary um, which includes words that are very useful in school um, so um, analyze would be one of their words parallel those sorts of words that are useful in school but they're also everyday words um, there is actually no slowing of growth at all so they they continue to improve throughout the entire period there's not any slowing of growth over summer holidays um, the effect of SES the higher children from higher SES backgrounds outperform children from lower SES backgrounds but the gap doesn't widen so in some ways you could interpret that either way you can interpret that as good news and that the gap's not widening less good news in the tense that it, it seems to be very persistent okay if you look at vocabulary they're actually learning in school so if you take items from the science curriculum um, so this is where you're taking much more um, specific vocabulary like for example reflection versus refraction transparent versus translucent that kind of those kind of terminologies where you have to um, where you actually learn them in school and it's not something you get from everyday language um, we do get a slower growth over summer holidays for those sorts of items as you would expect because they're not going to be about translucent 
cup of teas over the summer holidays, probably. Um, so you get you do get a slowing of growth over the summers, but the transition summer looks just like a, a normal summer. It's not. It's, it's not. There's nothing special about the summer between year six and year seven into our data here. And again, we've looked at word reading proficiency, their efficiency of word reading um, single words. And this doesn't look like much growth, but there is significant growth between every time point. Um, so they are continuing to grow, to grow here. There's no slump over the summer. And actually what's really nice about this, it does look like there's a tiny SES effect, but it's really tiny, it's not significant. It's a smaller than small effect size. Um, so really nice to see that um, the hard work that's gone in to teaching reading in schools is, is paying off. It is, it is effectively a, a leveler in terms of the SES. This is going away by the time we get to technical um, So implications. I've got three implications from this. So first of all, our first message is really that word reading proficiency is a key driver of vocabulary knowledge. So good news, if you're a good reader, and we know it can be taught, um, this is really good for your vocabulary learning. Bad news is that if you're reading below expected levels, and we know that about a fifth of our sample are reading about two years below what they should be when they enter secondary school, for those children, it'll be a barrier to learning. They won't be able to access the text that they need to learn from. So recommended actions, it's all about screening and diagnostic assessments. And what we would advise is, is to make sure that those assessments are sufficiently targeted so you know what, what they need. So uh, sorts of tests that they deliver in schools currently will not tell you whether it's a word reading proficiency difficulty a child has got, whether it's a reading comprehension difficulty at the moment. Um, so it needs to be much more targeted. Um, second um, point is that leisure reading is really, really important. So we know that we should be promoting leisure reading. Currently don't know how. Um, I think our main message is that although we tried really hard to get um, teenagers involved in helping us design this, we didn't develop it with them from the very outset. And I think you need to take the ideas from them. Don't just come up with our ideas and then check it with them. You have to actually get somehow get from them what is actually going to work in the first place. Um, final point is that the transition to secondary school is highly challenging. Um, so there's no, it's not, they're not, there's no reduced growth in basic schools. They're, they're continuing to get better at reading, they're continuing to get better at everything vocabulary, but there's a, there's a genuine problem in that secondary school teachers are finding that they're not performing as they would um, expect when they enter secondary school. And so it's really emphasizing that this is a, it's all about adapting to a new environment. And so there's a jump in demand rather than a slump in children's knowledge and skills. I think working at improving that transition, making it a much smoother transition is, is key. And in particular, ensuring that there's continuity between skills that they're learning in primary school and the skills and those skills, how to adapt those skills to the secondary school context is, is really key. Okay, and so thanks. It's a big, big team working on this. The key people, Professor Jesse Ricketts, Dr. Sanna and Klai, and Professor Adrian Burgess, many, many research assistants, many, many schools. Um, we work with over 50 secondary schools many, many teachers and participants and families involved. And these are our um, publications. So the first and the third is published. The second one is in print. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, uh, is that, have we got any questions for, for Laura? Um, the lady at the back, please. Oh, sorry, I've got, got the mic in the right place. Uh, very, very interesting this because I'm actually based in Blackpool in a school in Blackpool working with schools in Blackpool and 
I really liked when you said about the um, more able readers. Basically, we did our own surveys and the the more fluent the readers, the more competent the readers, the, the, they do not want to be tested on what they read. And many of the interventions in the upper key stage two, you know, they sort of have accelerator reader being one, for example, testing book blogger. It's lots of this testing. And when we, we spoke to the children, they didn't want it. So that's made us adapt. And yet, and yet the, the, the children with SEND, children with, with more, you know, difficulties, they do like it. They actually liked, they liked this to be able to have the progress and the success of the testing. So that sort of backs up what's actually happening um, there. Um, just some really, um, I, I, I like the idea about the, there's no slow, well, not the idea, but you say about there's no slowing of growth because what we've almost sort of established is that we've just got to do more in key stage two, which is what, because that's when we we do have the love for reading. The children really do. And I do know that just naturally children, as they get older, just they do, we know that they just read less. It doesn't mean they're going to be any worse off for not reading for pleasure. But if you can get them the younger possible, it does actually help. So as a result, we're doing an awful lot more at getting that will for read uh, reading in the earlier sort of years and certainly in key stage two. And I think we always say that the problem with the key stage two sat is it doesn't cut it at all. A child at 100 is not then prepared for what they face in the key stage three curriculum. And so we've got to do an awful lot more while we've got them to get them prepared. And it's just good to know that there isn't a drop off uh, as they move into key stage three. But at the same time, the more that we can do and it's working, it is working what we're doing and getting the children a lot more sort of wanting to read while we've got them uh, the younger they are. Yeah really important point like the fact that you've got this captive audience who are actually listening <laughs> at that point and making the most of making the most of them in later years of primary yeah we've got another question in the room um uh, maggie at the front please Thank you, Laura. That's really interesting and nice to see there's no slump. Um, as you know, I think Elsje van Ver Bergen has shown that um, print exposure, so leisure reading, is highly heritable. Um, I guess that means that um, parents are a key um, key figures in, in, in this. Yeah. And I agree with the last speaker. There's probably a window of opportunity where you need to get kids on board with reading, and that might also mean involving their parents. So, um, yeah, I, we've actually been very influenced by um, Elsha's work, in particular the fact that um, she's been able to show the link from reading proficiency through to leisure reading. So, and I think we take encouragement from that in that, although obviously there's a huge amount of heritability, there's also the hope that if you can get the proficiency up, you can then trigger more, more reading for pleasure. So, um, but the heritability, yeah, it's it's difficult. You either avoid the issue and bring it all into schools and do as much as you can within your control, or just we need to do some more um, co-development work together with young people and find out how their environment could be changed. Yeah, I think you do have to do it early, but I think you could harness parents parents yeah. earlier on yeah yeah i think we should um can we go to alice now please see if anybody's got any questions online yes we have a question from mrs cochran which says has there been any research into using audio books instead of reading text does children's vocabulary imp improve in the same way with children who listen to audio books that's such a good point yeah <laughs> um so we need to actually do the research but the theory um so this comes from professor jessica fitz's his work um the theory is that you should you should be getting the same vocabulary exposure from audiobooks as you should as you do from um reading them yourself um there is an advantage to seeing the words in print but that advantage is is less if you're a proficient reader so the more proficient reader you are, um, the less the need for the printed version. Um, so it's almost like you get the get the orthography for free 
if you're if you're a good reader and you're able to then conjure up that that, that representation. So I, I would say, or I, my advice would always be if the child's a reluctant reader but they're prepared to listen to audiobooks, definitely encourage that. And it's a very very good strategy for exposing them to book language. Yeah, we'll just take one more question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I just comment on, on, on that answer before asking my question. I think it, it's an interesting point. And I, I think what I agree with what you say that really audio books should do the job that reading books do. But I, it's an empirical question. But I also think there's something from the physical object of the book and the episodic and physical cues that come from reading when we can remember encountering a, a word in a book on that page three quarters of the way through the book. And that you don't get that in the audio domain because of the temporal dynamics being quite different. So, uh, but you, I guess you would predict audio books will be better than podcasts because of the conversational versus structural narrative. Yeah. But yeah, so my question is sort of related to that. It's about your second um, paper on there. So that's the Tempest finding, I think, which was really nice to see. And although you underplayed it, there were relatively few demonstrations of frequency at both the item and participant yeah. level, which you've demonstrated really nicely. And I just wonder if there's anything else in that data set that might be interesting to explore, although I see it's a registered report, in that you might have other distributional information about your words. So I don't know if you've got stuff where you can count, you can see whether children have gone backwards and reread or something about the sort of spacing. Do they get Tempest over a number of different days or a number of different books, or is it just all in one reading episode. So whether you can push the frequency effect a little bit more to look at other information in the distribution of exposure. That's a really good suggestion, actually. We can't, um, we haven't got the level of detail to know whether they track back. We can do, we can get all of the detail that we've got from the electronic book. So we can, we can look at spacing, that would be really nice. Um, in terms of your question about the words, in general, um, we've picked out words that are relatively more frequent than you'd expect in that particular book. So usually it will be that say that word reoccurring in the same book. But the children might have been reading it over a number of chapters or a number of days or, yeah. or something like that. The spacing might be... will vary massively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Thank you. I'm, I'm a, I know we've got a few more questions, but I'm, I think we have to draw it um, to a close now, I'm afraid, because otherwise we're not going to have a chance for, for a quick break before the uh, second session. So thank you very much, Laura. Please uh, give her a round of applause. Uh, sorry, if I, um, there was meant to be a 10 minute break um, and then we overran and five minutes is, it was never enough to get everyone through the toilets and through the coffee and, and tea. So sorry for starting five minutes late, um, but I won't hold us up anymore. Uh, I'd just like to welcome uh, Sarah McGuin, who's going to talk to us about uh, Love to Read. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so yes, my name is Sarah McGuin. I'm here from the University of Edinburgh. And today I'm going to be talking about Love to Read on behalf um, of the team. Um, Love to Read was a programme in which we co-created and evaluated um, a programme which was designed to increase children's motivation and engagement to read. And today I'll primarily be talking about the evaluation um, of this programme. So just to put this within context, we know that throughout the primary school years, children's attitudes towards reading and their reading activity declines, to the extent that at the age of around 9 to 11, less than half of children read outside of school. And the importance of reading for pleasure is also reflected within the national curriculum. For example, um, the national primary curriculum of England states that it, ensure, it aims to ensure that all pupils develop a habit of reading widely and often, both for pleasure and information. Despite the fact that we know that there's lowering attitudes towards reading and that this is a curricular priority, and there really is a lack of um, research informed pedagogy in order to support teachers in this endeavour. And so that's something that we aim to do um, with this project. Another thing which was really at the heart of the Love to Read project was our methodological approach. As a research team, we were really fortunate to work in collaboration with children, teachers, other professionals such as education psychologists but also our external partners in order to co-create the programme. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into the details of that today, but if you're interested in learning any more about it, um, you can access um, the resource. And the reason for working is in this way is because we recognise that there's a disconnect between university-led research and what's going on in practice. So for example, a survey conducted by the NFER um, back in 2017 found that from 1,670 teachers who took part, 60% of teachers said that the ideas that they would use in practice would be ideas generated by themselves um, or by someone in their school, whereas only 7% of teachers said that they would draw upon university-based research 
in order to inform our practice. So it was really important to us that this, this was very much a kind of collaborative um, endeavor. There are two concepts which are really key to uh, the Lottery project. These are the concepts of greasy motivation and greasy engagement. So intrinsic greasy motivation is basically that sort of internal desire or drive to want to. And we know that intrinsic greasy motivation is a precursor to greasy engagement. For children who are more motivated to read are more engaged readers. They show higher levels of behavioral engagement. That is, they spend more time reading and they choose to read longer, more frequently. And again, there's research that shows benefits to this, for example, to read language We also know children who are more motivated to read also exert more cognitive effort while they're reading as well and put into place strategies in order to support their comprehension. So, for example, they may be more likely to spend time deciphering an unfamiliar word, or working out the meaning of a new word, or rereading a passage of text in order to make sense of it. So motivation acts as a sort of energizer which engages children's cognitive resources. And again, it's been shown to have benefits to children. Within the Lottery project, we were interested in the kind of broad and rich and diverse benefits that books have to offer. And so we were also interested in this concept of effective engagement, which is about readers' emotional responses. And we know that when children are reading and they're connected with books and they're really engaged with what they're reading, then books can provide opportunities for children Relax, to laugh, to pursue their interests, to escape to new worlds, to spend time with fictional friends. The reading really allows the children an opportunity to develop a knowledge and understanding of the world around them, but also of themselves and of other people. And we were also interested in this concept of social engagement, which is about the extended discussions, I suppose, that go on in the And again, there's a broad range of research using different methodological approaches which has shown the sort of rich and diverse benefits that come from reading books, which aren't restricted only to reading and language skills, but also, as I said, to knowledge and understanding of the world, themselves and others, well-being, empathy, perspective taking, identity development, um, etc. The Lot to Read project was an 18-month project. It's split into four stages, um, and so I'm just going to run through um, what the project looked like. So in the first stage, um, we synthesized a sort of extensive body of research from research from different disciplinary traditions, not just psychology, but also we looked at how it um, linked with the relevant curricula and in the And from this, we sort of synthesized what was quite a complex and diverse body of research, so I guess, key messages which would underpin the program. And these were the principles what the research says with regards to pleasure. So the six principles are those of access, choice, time connection, social and success. Access is about making sure children have regular and easy access to schools that align books at school, that's align with their reading habits and interests. It's really about ensuring that there's quality book provision in school, which reflects the needs, the interests and the experiences of learners. And this is a really important foundation. It's really hard to increase children's motivation and engagement to read if they don't have access to these. Choice was about making sure that children had choice over their reading, that schools had in place the structure to facilitate the choice, but also that children were taught the skills in order to choose books which really aligned with their interests and abilities as well. And this is one of the things that came out of the project, teachers recognising that children just didn't have the skills in order to do this. The concept of time is about making sure children have regular quality time to read books they engage with in school and at home. Connection is about being able to access and choose books which are personally relevant and relevant to a child's reading book. Social is about those sort of extended discussions that go on around books, about having the time, the opportunities and skills to share and discuss books with others. And within the Love to Read project, we took this kind of broader idea of what it means to be a successful reader. A successful reader isn't just someone who's good at reading and reads a lot. A successful reader is someone who, for example, choosing to read more at home or feels more confident choosing to read more confident contributions Throughout the project, we were really fortunate to work with a talented illustrator, but also in five classes of children from across the UK who helped us to create these illustrations in order to exemplify each of the principles. And so through a very sort of iterative and quite fun and creative process, and the children really fed into um, the concept behind the principles. So the idea is that they're a powerful portal. Children open up the book um, and it gives them a portal of the world. And children gave um, input in terms of 
color, the design, um, and the product. That was phase one, which was really about bringing together all of this research into in phase two, um, we then asked children about reading for pleasure practices in school, the perspectives of these, their experiences of them, any ideas that they would have to support reading for pleasure, and then we also asked them their thoughts about each of these. And this stage um, was led by um, Emily Oxley, our postdoc. Then synthesized everything that we'd learned from research and from the children as well, put it all together, and we wrote quite an extensive document which we shared with our um, extended team member at Education Scotland, and she checked through it just to make sure that's all the teachers. And we'd be, um, oh yeah. Uh, I hope everyone could hear me until then. Um, so we worked with, um, uh, we, we recruited um, six teachers, sorry, in order to co-design the programme. Um, we um, had quite a um, competitive process, so we stopped applications at 50. We had 50 really talented, fantastic teachers who could help us with this project. Um, and some of them have gone on to kind of remain friends of the project. But we ended up recru recruiting six teachers who came from very sort of different backgrounds, different experiences of working in different school contexts. And we co-designed the Love to Read programme um, through a series of online meetings, but also offline communication, where teachers would submit their ideas, we'd synthesise these things together, and then in the online meetings, we'd make decisions about which activities. We were also really fortunate to have um, input from our practice partners, and I'll, I'll mention them at the end, and then we um, developed the programme. And then in autumn of last year, we carried out a six-week feasibility study. So this was across four schools. It was mixed methods, and we had a dual focus on implementation, so acceptability and feasibility, but also um, on effectiveness. And just to say that all phases of the Love to Be program have project have been pre-registered. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about each of these, you can access them there. In our evaluation, we aim to evaluate the acceptability and the feasibility of the primary school of the um, program in primary schools. We were interesting, interested to see if there'd be any changes in children's reading motivation, engagement, or any of the kind of attitudes, behaviors, or skills associated with the six protocols. But we were also really interested to learn about children and teachers' perspectives um, and experiences um, of the program. So as I said, the evaluation had two different aspects to it. One was an um, implementation aspect, and the other one was looking um, at effectiveness. And this is just to give you an idea of the data sources that we drew upon. This is quite a complex evaluation, um, and the volume of data that we had to draw upon. So in terms of implementation, this is just some of the feedback that we received from um, the teachers. Generally, the feedback was really positive, and I think working with teachers to co-design the program really supported it and facilitated this. The program was far more sort of visual than we had than we, we have anticipated. There was a lot of really sort of practical examples as to how teachers could embed these principles um, into practice. Um, so a lot of really positive feedback as a result of the But there were a number of concerns as well in terms of we um, asked teachers to deliver it over six weeks in order to sort of trial it. Um, and some teachers thought that perhaps this wasn't long enough. Others said that, you know, you've got limited time, of course, within a school day, and this is taking time away from focusing on reading skills and looking at reading for pleasure um, instead. And also um, some recognised that there was really a lack of resources to support the programme. And again, we really recognised the quality of education in school. There were some other concerns that I haven't listed here, so concerns about the number of activities that we had and the order of activities. And so we've removed about 30% of the activities from that programme to reduce any duplication and to integrate some together. And also concerns about um, some of the resources as well. And so we're working with the graphic designer to make sure. So thinking about effectiveness, first of all, I'm going to um, share some of the things that children had to say um, after taking part in the Love to Read program. And these can be thought of, I suppose, as a sort of intermediate outcome. So the types of attitudes, behaviours and skills that children were recognising happened as they were taking part. And I'll just give you this.
and in terms of what the teachers had to say as well, so teachers were really noticing changes in children's attitudes, beliefs and confidence, their skills as well around sort of book selection and book recommendations and in, in their behaviours um, too. And teachers also recognised changes to their own pedagogical practice as a result of So moving now to thinking about effectiveness, so we had um, a number of measures, a number of surveys looking at motivation and engagement of children completed prior to taking part in the program and then after the program as well. I did when we pre-registered this phase of the project, we actually pre-register it as an accessibility and feasibility study, which was assessing really the implementation. We were really sceptical, if I'm honest, as to whether we would see changes in six weeks, and if we did see changes in six weeks, whether we existed and, and revisited. That said, we did pre-register as exploratory analysis, looking at measure, looking to see if there were any increases which happened. And we found no statistically significant changes in engagement, or the six weeks of Now this, sorry, so, so this could reflect this could reflect a number of different things. So one of the things it could simply reflect is that um, the program was running for too short a period. It could also reflect the fact that there was a lack of sort of professional development to support teachers as well. So we created a program and teachers were um, required to sort of engage in independent self-directed study through the program. Teachers were also given the program and had like two weeks to look at it before it had to start off as well. So there are a number of reasons as to why we may not have found these. But there were also issues with our measures as well. So across all of our surveys, across 52 questions, the modal response at pretest was M3, and for a quarter of the questions it was four, and this is based on a four-point scale. So there's really no way to measure sort of any potential M for growth. So what we did was sort of further exploratory analysis, and we selected those children who were about one standard deviation from the mean in terms of their reading engagement, and we found um, uh, for most constructs there was still sort of very small or no significant Effect, but there was a large um, effect size for engagement, but it's really important that we interpret this with caution because obviously we're selecting on the basis of low engagement, which exasperates the chances of actually finding an increase. In terms of the conclusions and implications, I think love to read, we've created the program which I think is acceptable and feasible for teachers to use in practice. In fact, teachers are really positive about using the program. I think the qualitative of insights were generally very positive. They've given good examples of the types of intermediate outcomes that can come as a result of the program being in schools. And in the quantitative results, we find no statistically significant differences, but I think there's a lot of feasible interpretations um, from this. In terms of the implications for education, we've now sort of got a program which um, is research informed, which can support children's motivation and engagement in reading, and it will be available, freely available from June 2020. Um, but we do need to be thinking really carefully about the implementation of this, the duration, and supporting teachers' professional development. Um, and just to say, although I've not had the opportunity to talk much about the methods for this project, on behalf of the research team, I really would like to thank all of the children and the teachers and the other professionals who really contributed their knowledge, experience, expertise, enthusiasm to the project. It has been really a team effort, and we're just really grateful. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to be involved um, in this project. Um, so just um, to say thank you, this is our research team um, and our extended partners as well. Um, if you're interested, I have some bookmarks up here if you'd like to take one home. Um, and we'll be putting more things up on our website um, in June, um, so you'll be able to access a lot more information. About that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So I see Laura is saying we don't know how to improve motivation. Obviously, this is an attempt to 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 address that. And um, does anybody have any questions for Sarah? Um, lady here, please. 
Oh, a, a couple of questions. Um, was it all with Scottish schools? Um, no. So when we um, gather children's insights in terms of to inform the programme, we work with two schools in Scotland and two schools in England, and these were actually very demographically diverse children. Um, uh, and in terms of the evaluation, we had three schools in England. So the project part, um, the other members of the team, um, Jesse and Laura, are based in Birmingham and London. So we had two in London, one in Birmingham, one in sort of Edinburgh area. And again, the schools were quite diverse, I suppose, in terms of the catchments and the, the learners within. Um, and, and secondly, you, you mentioned um, mixed methods, but I wasn't sure what you were referring to. Okay, so the mixed methods approach, I suppose, was really about having the sort of quantitative measures, but also the qualitative measures as well. So we could hear from children and teachers who actually experienced the programme, what it was like and what they felt they were getting from it. Thank you very much. Um, Alice, uh, have we got any questions online? No, nothing online. From anybody, anything else in the room? Um, Dom at the back, please. Thanks. I was really interested in the comment about time because of the pressure to deliver on skills versus uh, prioritising um, motivation and engagement. I wonder if you had any more to say. Was, was, did the qualitative data reveal any more about those tensions? I think that, I mean, there's a lot of research that shows the benefits of leisure time reading, for example, in terms of benefiting children's reading and language skills. And so what we want to do within schools is sort of create a time for children to find books that they're really enjoying, that they're really engaged with, that they have a bit of time to school in order to read that, but that it's actually promoting that kind of reading outside of school as well. And I think part of it is trying to convince teachers that actually spending that time developing those skills and choosing books, giving children that bit of time to read in school can actually let them become, I guess, more independent and self-motivated learners so that they're choosing to read outside of school as well. Um, but I do really recognise that uh, every day is sort of quite, quite packed for teachers. Um, and so we really are stressing the sort of the range of benefits that come from reading books that are benefits to reading and language skills, as well as some of the sort of social and emotional ones I spoke about. Um, Any other questions here? Um, at, the, at the front, please? A provocative question. Do you think we ask children to start reading too soon? And could we spend that foundation year more doing something like this, where they just learn to love books and reading and being read to, rather than their first experience for some kids of books being, this is hard and I can't do it? So there is research that looks at the sort of reciprocal relationship between children's reading motivation and reading skills. And that research starts that it shows that it starts with reading skills. So you need to give children the skills to become independent and successful readers. And that sort of sets in that cycle from reading motivation. So a lot of my own kind of earlier research was actually around sort of systematic phonics instruction. And actually, I do believe that we should be providing systematic phonics instruction in school that it should be done in a way that's really fun and engaging and it shouldn't be at the expense of developing a love and interest in books, words and stories. So I, I'm not sure. I think in England it's very different because children are aged four in reception. Yeah. <laughs> in Scotland it's actually very different. And the difference between a four-year-old and a five-year-old is actually quite considerable. Um, but I, I think that, you know, speaking with Laura as well, because I know she's done a lot of work in this area, I think books provide a really useful way to develop sort of phonological awareness skills that can kind of set that foundation and if all children have sort of bridged the gap in phonological awareness skills early on so that they're all getting phonics instruction at the time in which they're ready for it I think that that has the potential to be beneficial um, but I certainly never say reading motivation at the expense of reading skill that's not no, I agree with that, but I'm just thinking about those kids, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, who probably haven't had people reading to them. If you think about the proficient kids, they're coming to school, having been read to their whole lives, they get that books are really fun and really cool and can give you all of those extra word, worlds, whereas some kids don't know that. Yeah, we actually, so we have funding from the Education Endowment Foundation and for a Love to Read Reception Year programme, which is actually specifically working with children on this type of idea and um, children who are coming to school who maybe haven't had those kind of book reading experiences at home and sort of building that foundation with them as well so that's with um, Jamie Lingwood um, so yeah I do I do think it is that but I also I remember being at a conference a few years ago and speaking to a teacher and she said I can't focus on reading for pleasure now I'm trying to get children focused on this. and I just I worry about the messages that I don't know if teachers are even getting but what they're hearing 
And I think there's always been this tension between skill and motivation, but actually these two things are so closely linked together. Um, and so we really need to be making sure that we're addressing that, I guess, that link between. Thank you very much. We need to bring that to a close to leave time for the next presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Please uh, give her a round of applause. Now to welcome uh, Maria and Joanne, who are going to talk to us about uh, their evaluation of uh, some reciprocal reading in secondary. Thank you. Good morning, actually nearly afternoon. Diane and I are going to keep it short today. I know it's nearly lunchtime, um, and we'll link you to the So we've been working on this project for two years, and this morning we'll talk you through what the project, background to it, what we actually did, what we found, and then what we um, recommend. So what we already know, you know, what are the findings from research in the UK? Um, we know that reciprocal reading, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is next, but we know that reciprocal reading as a targeted intervention uh, does have significant effects on attention, um, and, and we know this from a study um, which was done, uh, funded by the EEF in 2017 to 18, um, where reciprocal reading used as a targeted intervention, year five and six showed a positive effect. And then um, the program was adapted and used with uh, year seven students uh, a couple of years later. And again, we found some. So, background to reciprocal reading, if, if you don't know about it, comes from. Um, links are in the 1980s, mainly used in New Zealand and then the US. And then in more recent years, it was further adapted. Um, and we've been working with uh, Family Trust Literacy, who adapted the program. Um, and, and rather than use the reciprocal approach, they developed suitable reading. And this is the structure that they use. So really, in essence, it's a cooperative learning approach. And we know that cooperative learning um, has high impact on students' learning, uh, yeah, which is just about five months edition of October in general. Um, so the reciprocal reading is a cooperative learning approach where the children work in a structured way, generally in small groups, where they understand the purpose of what they're doing, they have a structure for doing it, there's uh, personal accountability and group. Um, Within the reciprocal reading sequence in every session, there is a specific sequence. Um, they use age-appropriate books, and the, the children look at the books. They start by predicting what they're going to read, generally in a very small amount of text. Then they go on and read that text more fully, um, and then they start clarifying the, spe the specific words that they may not understand. Um, and then they go on to question themes, and then they go on to summarize. And then they review and reflect what they've read. And they repeat that sequence about three times during a lesson. So it's very much a discussion based. So as we know, reading is a global endeavor at the moment, particularly post pandemic. And we ran the, the actual reciprocal reading project between September 21 and July 22. So it was post pandemic, but schools were still closing. Um, you know, it was generally a disaster for schools. And, and we worked with 20 schools and they all engaged brilliantly. So this was a randomized control trial. And the point of it was to build on previous research where we had already identified a positive effect um, to look whether, see whether the reciprocal reading is deliverable at greater scale than we've done previously, and then 
to look at the outcome on student So who participated? Well, we worked with 20 schools, um, and the schools were located northwest, northeast, and a lot of local authorities, 11 of them. From um, They all had high levels of socioeconomic students. Each school had up to 40 students, um, which they selected using a diagnostic tool for really help look at those students that um, were able to decode but still had difficulties with comprehension. So this was not um, a decoding comprehension is not chronic. Um, in total there were 782 students and the average uh, FFM was 32. So the students were randomized so each school had half the students who were who were in the treatment group, they received the intervention, and the other half continued as control and continued with whatever else the school thought they needed. And as you'll see from the findings, they really needed a lot, and they threw everything at school. So who what was involved? This is just a kind of summary of our logic model, if you like. Um, each school had uh, school and staff teams. And that was made up of three, uh, a lead and two delivery staff assistants. Um, the project was for targeted students, so maximum, um, maximum 16, so they had two groups uh, to be delivered, and, and therefore the rest were controlled. Um, the staff training and support was quite intensive, and that was all delivered by uh, Bishop Family Trust Literacy, and staff two days of external training in this project because of COVID uh, restrictions. One day was delivered um, physically, and then the other day was delivered online. However, all schools were working in staff teams during that delivery time. And then there was online support for schools. They also received program resources, um, the teaching manuals, um, a set of reading books which were age appropriate, and dictionary teaching. So what was delivered in the classroom? Um, the, inter the intervention was delivered over approximately two terms. Um, again, because of COVID closures and things, that, that may have gone into two terms here. Um, for approximately 30, 30 minutes per session per week. Um, as I said before, it's a cooperative learning structure in small groups, so children were divided into small groups. Eight, each led by a teacher during each session. And within each session, they uh, ran three cycles of key response. So what changes would we expect to see? And we would have expected to see staff knowledge to improve and their instruction to improve, and also students to learn cooperatively how to use the resources and strategies and students' awareness of the resources sequenced. And that would result in students reading uh, comprehension and overall reading. In terms of the impact, so we used that better. We used um, the new group reading test from um, GL assessment um, and the um, art test from RS assessment. And um, these are both online, independently um, standardized, created standardized tests. And we used that pre and post. And then we measured the difference between. Um, the control group and the group at the end. So we found that students in the treatment group who received reciprocal reading in this particular study performed no better, but they also performed no worse than those that continued with the control group. And, and we wondered, well, why? Because we found the effects um, previously both at key stage two and at key stage three. Um, now, partly when, when you When you scale up a project, uh, the likelihood is that there are fewer effects to be found. Nevertheless, um, we found that the, the baseline scores, both the control group and the intervention group, were lower than we 
from previously, but we found that there was similar progress to the intervention group and those that received reading in this particular study to what we have seen in previous studies. Just that the control group made the same amount of progress, really. Um, and there were a lot of catch up interventions that were being thrown at them, a lot of them that were already evidence. I'm going to hand you over to Joanne, my colleague, who's going to talk about the process of evaluation. So uh, alongside uh, the quantitative uh, side that Maria's just spoken about, um, we did an extensive process evaluation. Um, so why did we do this process evaluation? We wanted to gather as much data as we could regarding um, implementation fidelity, um, to look at things like the intervention activities implemented as intended? What specific activities were implemented? Were all the strategies uh, of reciprocal routing implemented in the way that they should be with these cycles? And to what extent did the staff and the students engage? And what did that look like? Did the activities help realize the program objectives? <clears throat> And we wanted to find out if the program was not implemented as intended, what conclusions could we draw? And all of that there, um, we, we gathered via process data. So we used staff surveys, we used school interviews, we used um, case studies, we used um, naturally occurring data from sessions and training sessions. <clears throat> and, and, and interviews with the teachers. So the reason we gather this, I suppose, as well, is it, it helps pave the way for improvements for the program developer, you know, what worked and what didn't work. But it also um, provides a narrative around uh, Maria's quantitative um, side as to, um, you know, what, what worked and what didn't work and why did it not work. So what did we find from the process evaluation? <clears throat> we found that all schools engaged in the training and used the resources as per the content design. All of the schools succeeded in timetabling and delivering the intervention. And controlled students um, did not engage in the reciprocal reading intervention. However, we did find that the schools reported um, a variety of, as Maria has already mentioned, a variety of information interventions for the control group um, and this was due to, to the COVID catch-up. Um, so in short we found that it's possible to implement reciprocal reading uh, the secondary program in secondary schools at a greater scale than pre previously attempted. So back to me. So yes we can say reciprocal reading is implementable in secondary schools. We had the full engagement of the 20 schools, both in terms of training and in terms of delivery, and all schools implemented reciprocal reading with effective deployment of staff across the board. Um, and all schools also adhere to content design. I just have to say here, caveat, um, when, we, when, when the trial was done in Key Stage 2 in secondary, the reciprocal reading sessions were delivered and were designed to be delivered twice a week for 30 minutes. Um, once we moved to secondary and on the advice of the secondary schools, we adapted that and so they were delivering it for longer, um, but only once a week. And in this particular trial, purposely, we decided not to tell schools when they had to deliver it, but we did say that it had to be delivered for you know, a minimum of 600 minutes uh, across the board and not during English lesson time. So I think there was variation in the delivery per schools. Some schools delivered it in registration and form time, which gave them the 20 to 30 minutes, but others um, delivered it in non-curriculum time, sorry, not non non subject time, so in art classes or like, and that gave them 40 to 60 minutes. So I think that's that's an area that we need to we need to look at. And and as, as I said before, we found that the treatment group performed no better or worse than the control group. 
so in terms of recommendations, one minute. Um, we know that schools are using a lot of things and doing really well to try and help their children in secondary at the moment, particularly during COVID. And it would be useful to gather the evidence of exactly what schools are using in a systematic manner. And we'd like to explore the reciprocal reading delivered at different times of day. So, you know, which is better, preschool uh, registration time or lesson time. And also may perhaps to develop a more standardized approach in secondary that is more akin to the primary one, which is where it has delivered twice a week where we know we had. Um, just school experiences, schools seem to still be using it. I'm not going to go through these, but you'll, you'll be able to see them later on. Um, the students seem to love it and the school is still using it. A school from, the, from, from West Yorkshire, again, is still using it. They found great progress in their particular school um, and they continue to use it as a small group intervention. And again, 32% of students, uh, sorry, a school in the Northwest with 32% of students by deprivation, again, are continuing to use it. So having run out of time, I'd like to thank the Nuffield Foundation for funding this. It's been a tremendous project. Um, I'd like to thank our partners at uh, Fisher Family Trust Literacy, who were so good at supporting schools and delivering the training throughout. Um, and I hope we will have further funding to do more work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria and Joanne. Um, time for a couple of questions. Um, any, any questions from anybody in the room? Uh, in that case, uh, I'll move to Alice, um, who has got some questions online. Uh, there's a question from Jenny Price, which asks, um, what level of skill did the staff delivering the intervention have? Really good question, thank you. So, the, as I said, there was a team trained with a teacher lead who was um, generally a, a literacy expert. And, and a teacher, obviously, and the delivery was undertaken by teaching assistants generally, um, but they were monitored and supported by the literacy lead. So in terms of planning, the group would always plan the sessions together, and the T's and A's would then deliver it, but it was always well monitored by the teacher. Um, so in answer to the question, there isn't any specific experience that the TAs may or may not have had. We didn't measure whether they were higher level TAs or not, the whole team was integral to the delivery. Yeah, there's a question at the back, please. Thanks. I was wondering if there's any plans to test or to evaluate later on, because possibly the effects might be longer term than the window within which you tested, particularly as it seems to be very motivating. Yes, so no, not within this particular project funding, um, but we, we did do a sort of a sensitivity analysis, uh, which again will, will probably publish later on, um, to, to look at, because there were so many children absences, um, to look at those children that actually had received the program for the 600 minutes plus uh, compared to the control group. And in fact, we found that there were no differences between those that received it for six minutes and the control group, um, which would lead us to believe that therefore the variability and the delivery time isn't necessarily significant to the, to the project outcomes, which is similar to what we found before. Very little relationship. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we've got time for one more up at the front, please. Um, when you when you looked at their decoding ability, um, did you look at how fluent they were decoding, or only at whether they could decode it? Yes. So, what we gave teachers is something that we've always, well, that FFT literacy have always used in the past, um, and and that seemed to work previously, which is simply a, a single sheet of A4 for teachers to make a judgment as to how fluent. The, the students were in terms of their phonics ability and how well they were able to decode in terms of phonics ability. Um, and then what their comprehension, like, i.e., if they were having difficulty. So they were given prompts, um, questions for them. 
prompts about those, but it was very much a, a sort of formative assessment for the future for that future child. Thank you. Kate, okay, thank you very much. Um, please give uh, Maria and Joanna a round of applause. And thank you very much to all our speakers in, in total. We're now going to move on to the panel session. Um, please, everyone, bear with us while we just, uh, we're just going to have to shift the camera from focusing on the lectern to over here. Um, and please go and invite our panelists up. We've got um, J Jesse Ricketts. Uh, there we go. Yes, brilliant. So uh, I'll, wait, I'll wait for the camera to be shifted before I introduce everyone. We'll use this mic. Uh, Rafa, are we ready? Good, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Douglas, Chief Executive of the National Literacy Trust, um, Kaida Fayez, Assistant Head at St Matthews Research School in Birmingham. Uh, and Professor Jesse Ricketts from Royal Holloway, who are here to kick off the panel discussion. Um, I said the kind of questions for, the, for consideration that, I, um, that we outlined at the beginning are what might be the most important issues to tackle to improve children's reading attainment? Uh, what else do we need to know about how to tackle those issues? How can we best translate what we know into workable solutions and um, any implications of the sorts of research we've heard today for education policy? Um, so I've asked it, the panel members to say a few words uh, in response to one or more of those questions, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Jonathan, you want to kick off, if that's okay? Um, yeah, it, it, it was an extraordinary morning. Loved every minute of it. And, and of course, the truth is that the themes which were identified in the presentation, language, early identification of specific need, yeah, volitional reading, higher comprehension skills, all of those themes are absolutely, of course, at the very heart of the agenda, aren't they? Um, and um, I, it, it, it feels slightly irresponsible for me to start this discussion, actually, because I'm, I'm not an academic. I, I come from a charity world. Um, and so what are, my observations are very much about the kind of interface between um, the research which we've discussed, the research agenda, and also our experience as a charity, and also the policy agenda. So, so I've got th kind of scribbled down three things that kind of occurred to me. The first was um, the, um, the very terms of reference for today. Um, the, the, the implicit assumption, and we've nudged beyond that wonderfully, particularly through the last presentation, but the implicit assumption is that literacy itself is, is a job for the primary sector. Um, and um, taking the long view, taking that, that wider view, taking that wider perspective is obviously absolutely essential. And I think we're increasingly aware of the codependency on the early years, on early language acquisition, even of attachment itself to literacy attainment within the primary sector. But um, one of the things I was discussing briefly over coffee was the fact that next year we're awaiting the results of the PIAC study, you know, the adult education um, uh, study, the OECD study, which, of course, the last time it was published, catastrophically for, for, for England, demonstrated that actually the 16 to 24 age group uniquely in the OECD, almost uniquely, in the OECD grouping, had the lowest levels of literacy, and by literacy it meant reading skills, in, 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 the, in the countries participating. And of course, what was particularly devastating about that was that cohort, the 16 to 24 cohort, was the, was the group who'd gone through the national literacy strategy and therefore we're actually anticipated to have the highest age cohort levels of skills of any group since the, 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 the second world war so so yeah we understand the codependency on, uh, in terms of uh, well, increasingly early language acquisition and attempt but actually if what we're talking about today is to fulfill its potential then actually stretching the conversation so strongly thinking absolutely as we've been talking about about comprehension but also thinking about volitional reading and thinking about um, disciplinary literacy how academic literacy is taught consistently in the secondary sector as a as a fulfillment of, of this conversation is so important so the first thing i want to just throw the bung in was was the long view that wider perspective the second theme um, is very much about socioeconomic um, status i mean that that has been referred to um, in a in a number of ways. And of course, we know that the British cohort study has absolutely demonstrated that it is the it is education that mediates intergenerational patterns of disadvantage in 
in this country. That, that is now, you know, and of course, we also know that of all the components of education which mediate that difference, literacy, because of its close identif identification with cultural and social activities, is, 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 is so, so central. And certainly from our perspective, from the work which we do, the dynamic around socioeconomic disadvantage now is creating a completely new conversation with the education sector sector about what inequality itself means it's not something simply to be controlled for it's not something simply to it is it is the very heart of the you know, the, the, the 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 increase in child poverty which is being looked at at the moment which we're experiencing at the moment is the highest and the most sudden increase this society has experienced for a hundred years this is a phenomenal phenomenon <laughs> a product of the cost of living crisis, the product of the tail end of, of economic issues beyond um, the education sphere, and of course the experience of the pandemic. But that, that experience of, of inequality um, finds its way to the experience of literacy, obviously through vocabulary in the home, through resources in the home. But we also now know through things like the, the, the cost of living research, which the Child Poverty Action Group has done, through the direct experience of the curriculum itself. So for me, one of the key themes is how we now actually stare that experience of child poverty in, its, in the face as a defining factor in terms of literacy in this country um, and how, how education research itself can engage with the multifaceted and dynamic nature of child poverty as a driver of, of, of primary reading. And the third thing um, is, is, is very much about, well, I'm gonna say place, so, I mean, obviously there are two dynamics to professional practice. The first is knowledge. The first is how the, 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 you know, the, the, the research, the evidence that, that what we know about effective practice can be accommodated in professional practice, how teachers can, can employ the, the insight that, that we've been discussing this morning. The second, and that's kind of vertical um, dynamic, the second, which is more of a horizontal dynamic, is actually how, how professionals understand the context of the application. Um, and um, you know, uh, uh, in, in the work that, that we do, we see that happening, obviously, in terms of cohort awareness, understanding of specific needs, family backgrounds, that dynamic around the disadvantage which I was describing, but also in terms of system engagement. Um, and I think one of the big themes that we learned from the evaluations of um, the impact of, of Sure Start was that unless um, interventions engage with systems, their impact is limited. Now, what, you know, what does that mean? Well, from our perspective, that means that if you're experiencing high churn in terms of the primary system, and that's to do with the fact that the local authority decided four years ago to no longer register private landlords, actually the role of the uh, of school leadership has to be to engage with the stabilization of the housing stock to stabilize the cohort in the school so that it means that if the profile of that cohort is actually strongly related to a particular faith community where a gendered um, identity around parenting occurs then actually the ability to work proactively with that community is as important as implementing evidence in form so that those two dynamics are increased and, and thinking about the interplay now internationally now people like Canada are creating not simply what works concepts through um, the, the vertical but also through, the, through that horizontal dynamic so how is it what works locally interplays with and the professional insight of school leaders interplays and how do we build that capability and capacity at the same time as building the capability of the vertical so as I say totally irresponsible things to say to a group of people involved in, in quasi-experimental um, research, but things that are occupying my mind at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, hi, Dan. Do you, you have to turn the mic on. Is it green? It's green. Um, hi, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of um, context about the school that I come from. So um, I'm from St. Matthew's Research School. And when we're a research school, what that means is we work with the Education Endowment Foundation. There are about 35 of us in the country. Um, and we are the one with, there's two of us in the Midlands um, and St. Matthew's is one of those. Um, so I completely fill out my depth here, just so you, <laughs> you're all aware. Um, so I guess um, when I got sent the questions, the thing that I thought I could provide most insight into is how we take um, what 
we want to move forward with region attainment and what does that actually look like in a school and um, because we're a research school we are outward facing so we work with trusts bats um, across the country so we we do experience lots of different um problems in the explore phase when we're thinking about what it is but that schools need to move forward um and i suppose the question the microphone will stop shaking eventually i'm sure um i suppose the question um that we have to ask schools is what exactly is it that you want to move forward with your reading attainment? Because reading attainment is, um, there's lots of different strands that form that reading house that Kate Kane um, has talked about in the latest guidance report from the EEF. Um, and for us at school, it's about, yes, there's lots of issues around um, if a child doesn't come to school with the phonemic awareness, then we have a bigger job to do. Um, but heritability is unfortunately not in our gift to change. Um, what we can change is the things that we put into practice in the classroom to build that motivational reading um, that's been spoken about today. So um, we work a lot in the early stages of a child's um, schooling to ensure that they do have the skills to read. So um, our phonics program is systematic. We use Sounds Right, which is a program that is evidence-based. Um, and we ensure that through our work with the EEF that we allow schools to really explore what is it that phonics can provide because we use the systematic teaching of phonics to teach spelling across the whole of primary school. Um, the grapheme phoning correspondence is something that children in year five will use in order to help them spell archaeology. It's something that adults use. Um, and we, we reference a lot of work by Diane McGuinness, um, Why Students Can't Read and What We Can Do About It, which is a fantastic, fantastic book. Um, and she talks about how even as adults, what we think is sight reading, actually, we are segmenting and blending. We have these chunks of graphene phoning correspondences in our schema that we just bring to our working memory. And actually, in fact, that looks like we're reading a word by sight. But if we come across a word that we haven't met before, we are actually segmenting and blending it in a sophisticated fashion. Um, so in order to really um, ensure that reading attainment as children come through our early years and we do build, build the will as well as the skill, it's not one or the other, um, we want our teachers to have really have the subject knowledge, um, which is another thing that we have to do in order to improve reading attainment. So we take like a multifaceted approach to understanding what reading looks like in our school um, and with the schools that we work with. Reading comprehension, 100% is um, the key skills that the EEF say are the best bets to improve reading. Uh, things like prediction, clarification, summarising, not necessarily just the skills that are tested in the key stage two SATs. Um, we also ensure that our children have intervention if fluency is something that is causing them to stumble across that bridge. Fluency is the bridge from word recognition to comprehension. So if we have children that can decode, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can comprehend um, and vice versa. So what we want our children to be able to do is decode, a, decode whatever they are reading at no matter what level, um, but have and read it with prosody, have an understanding of what their intonation is like so that they can provide a fluent read for the rest of the class. Um, because the research is really strong around how a misprosodic reading of a text, I'm just thinking of a text in geography, for example, can actually have a hindrance on the way everybody understands it. So we've done a lot of work with our teachers. What is fluency? We use Tim Rosinski's fluency rubric to ensure that we can measure it. And it's not just this word that we're saying. We all have a shared mental model of what fluency is. And then that helps us build our understanding of how children can comprehend what we read. Um, so when we when we talk about improving reading attainment, we also think about the things that have been spoken about vocabulary today. Um, and we being a research school is a is a blessing because we do engage with a lot of research around um, cognitive science. We particularly engage with Eleanor Roche's work around prototypes and how when children see a word time and time and time and time again, they're not learning it by a dictionary definition, they're actually learning it by different prototypes. Um, so when we talked about it with staff, we said, when I say the word institution, what do you think of? And we had lots of examples, um, Judy Dench, um, <laughs> Cher, I thought of Cher, but there's Cher. <laughs> um, but there's just lots, 
that that's the same kind of thing and Christine Council talks a lot about that um, in her work around the curriculum that children don't remember things by a definition so when we're talking about proficient readers and children that have an extended and wide vocabulary it's through that real rich curriculum and broad curriculum that they'll understand that word and they'll see it time and time and time again um, so that's a kind of another action that we do at school um, is to make sure that our curriculum is really planned with thoughtful background knowledge texts that help the children understand what they're reading, um, not just in nonfiction, but in fiction too. Um, so we've got a really tight structure for in terms of what we provide the children with their books. Um, and we make link text so children can have a deeper understanding of the character um, because then that helps them understand more. And we know that successful pathways mean that children want to read more. Um, and when they see themselves in books, reflecting realities. So there's huge work um, being done by CLPE on reflecting realities. Um, and we we are, our school is in Neutral, so we've got a, a hugely diverse, um, I think we're 70% EAL. Um, we've got a hugely diverse beautiful rich heritage culture of children um, and actually we need to make sure that they're reflected in the books that we choose that their heritage is important and they bring it into the classroom so it's just there's just so there's so much I could talk for another two hours about what we do but um yeah I think it's it for us it's about being really specific with the what is it that is our problem in our context what can we do in order to achieve like reading attainment what do our, our teachers need to know in terms of subject knowledge much. Great, so it's been brilliant, I think, to hear about some um, work from non-academic partners here. I think my remit today was to try and think across the different research projects, um, and I've got five things that I wanted to say. Um, the first thing I wanted to say just comes from the title of the event, really, and that is that it is so very welcome to be thinking about reading from across both primary and secondary contexts, and that's something that Jonathan said as well. Um, particularly in conducting quite a lot of research in the secondary context recently, it's really welcome to see that light being shined um, because clearly some of these needs don't go away, but also we see newly emerging needs as children move up the system and the challenge changes. Um, I mean, the other thing that came up in discussions is that we need to very much work together across the two contexts because different things are possible in the different contexts teachers from primary schools and teachers from secondary schools bring very different expertise and knowledge and experiences. And so I think we all need to be working together across those contexts. The se second thing that I wanted to talk about really was, and now my screen has gone off, um, was to think across all of the different projects. I think they come together in thinking about not only development and progress as children move up the school system, but also identification of needs, which is so very important if we want to align those needs to targeted um, support and interventions, and also thinking about the nature of that, that support and intervention um, and reading culture that Sarah talked about as well. Um, certainly true, I think, and important to think about how the way that we identify needs might change as we go through the school system and the needs will change as i've just said as the challenge changes and becomes different and to some extent more um, complex um, but also the way that we support reading needs will be different um, so we can't assume, I think, that what works in primary is going to work in secondary. Uh, and I think actually the work uh, that Maria and Joanne talked about around reciprocal reading really exemplified that point. So we need to think about how we need to uh, reconstruct perhaps some of the active ingredients that we know might work in primary to think about how they might work in secondary. Um, one thing that came up particularly in discussions was thinking about the interplay between knowledge and skills on the one hand and behaviour on the other hand um, and reading for pleasure and, and also affect around reading, whether we enjoy reading, uh, whether young people enjoy reading. And I think what also is, is really exemplified today is the fact that we need to connect all of those things together. We need to think about those things together, not separately. And I think sometimes in research we have thought about those things a little bit too separately. Um, we were asked to talk a little bit about policy um, I would say, and I think I probably, I'm not on my own, I think probably everybody in this room would agree that it is our responsibility as a society to make sure that our young people can read. It's, that, I can't underline that enough, and I think we're all there on that page. Um, I think what policymakers can do to try and make that happen is ensure that the curriculum is joined up 
between primary and secondary. So that's really tricky for individual schools to do or even for maths to do um, or research schools. I think we need a policy level kind of approach to make sure that the curriculum is joined up. Um, but we also need more recognition from government that we need funding throughout the school system to support reading needs, not just early and primary. Of course, that's fantastically important, but we do need to see it continuing, particularly for those children who have very persistent needs or those children whose needs emerge later. Um, and finally, um, and Sarah has already said this so beautifully, what we need to make sure that we do in all of the work that we're doing, so for the research and also the way that we think about this research is implemented in context, is we need to collaborate. And we need to make sure that we are all collaborating together um, to make sure that we get the right kind of evidence and to make sure that that evidence actually can be translated into practice. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's really kind of provocative thoughts for everyone to uh, respond to. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll assume Alice will put her hand up if there's any uh, anything anybody wants to say online. If you could put your hand up high if you're in the online audience, because uh, now that I'm sitting down, I can't see um, the gentleman in the middle, please. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, can I just uh, thank Jonathan for reminding us all about the profoundly social and complex interplay that goes on as children become readers within the communities that they exist in. And that the, the issue I have around uh, some of the testing that's about and that we've been hearing about is that it simplifies it to single uh, parts of the process and that, that then uh, if schools use those tests, it then has implications for um, how they follow that up with interventions and teaching. So if you test, if your test focuses on phonics and word reading, then your follow up interventions are going to be uh, focused in that area. If your test is testing about vocabulary, then the implications are that you're going to focus on vocabulary in your intervention. And therefore, you ignore that enormous social context within which children uh, come to school in. And I think that any solutions that we have have got to take into account um, the complexity of that social world. And one thing that schools need to do and to find out about is what, what does literacy look like in the homes that children come from when they come into school, uh, rather than thinking about what do kind of literacy uh, behaviours do I want to see in the children? We need to start with the children themselves and the communities <laughs> that they come from. Is there anyone else, uh, anyone on the panel who wants to comment on that observation? Yeah, off you go, Haida. Okay. Um, I completely agree. We do a lot of work around the funds of knowledge. So Louis Moll's research um, and our head teacher is a advocate for children's cultural backpack, she calls it, um, and ensuring that we celebrate, we're at the stage where we are celebrating their cultural um, capital and the things that they offer to the classroom. Um, so we do allow time and space in the curriculum um, to ensure that that is valued and talked about um, in order to show that they have space and a voice in the classroom um, in terms of their literacy and what they can bring. Um, but unfortunately, we have the um, systemic um, pressures of teaching these skills so that the children can, you know, pass this test. And it's it's a much bigger picture than that. We That is not what drives us at school. Um, our vision at school is very, very national curriculum, but beyond. Um, so I think I think it would be great if lots of schools across the country could celebrate children's heritage and culture um, and not leave it at the door. Um. Are, there, are there any more questions in the room? At the back, please. I was very interested in the discussion about in several talks about motivation and its importance. And um, I am uh, quite interested in that partly because a lot of my work is on children's uh, maths progress and there is a big problem of math anxiety and often seriously interfering with performance. And 
um, I was wondering um, what people think is the situation with this with regard to literacy. The general impression one gets from the literature is that literacy anxiety is not as common or severe as maths anxiety, but it, that it does exist as a problem. But I was wondering if um, people have any comments on this. Jesse is keen for that one. Um, yeah, I think one of the real challenges in, in working in the secondary context is that if you have a child who has reading needs, who's been struggling with reading, they've been struggling with, with reading for a long time and despite a lot of input and a lot of instruction. And when I talk to secondary teachers about the, the, the key challenges for them in supporting those children, um, in secondary, what they say is that their main um, challenge is compliance, actually. And I think that very much comes from an anxiety. And if it wasn't there to start with, it builds over time. And I think by the time you get to secondary, it is wrapped up in this kind of very complex um, identity about not being a good reader, not being able to read, reading not being for you, reading not being something that you want to do. Um, and I think that's really challenging. I think what the work um, that Laura talked about, our work um, with Laura, also shows is that actually there's an element of reluctance across the board in adolescence. Uh, and in some cases that will come from anxiety, is what I would say. Um, and also, I mean, that there's very important messages about early habit forming, as we've talked about too. Um, I don't know uh, how, whether we can compare anxiety for maths with anxiety for literacy. Um, I think our observations and talking to children suggest that children are more inclined to say that they don't like maths or that they're not good at maths than they are to say that they're not good at reading. Um, but it would be really interesting to compare the two the two things, actually, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of points. The, the, the first is um, one of the things we've really learned from Sarah's work has been the importance of, um, uh, of children's self-awareness of their, of their skills as a platform, as an element to, to the development for, of intrinsic motivation, that confidence that, 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 you know, that you can do it. So the elimination of, or the minimization of anxiety is obviously a key, a key component of that. The other thing which is interesting is, you know, we work closely with our sister charity, National Numeracy, um, and um, the attitudes and, and behaviors around, uh, around numeracy skills and literacy skills are significantly different. And that's something which, however you feel about it, the prime minister has, has, has shone a light on recently. And certainly what would be very interesting, I'm not aware of it, is whether there is any work looking, certainly at, at a societal level, the, 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 the ability to shrug off the fact that, that you, you have problems with maths is very different in terms of, 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 of identity to, to issues around um, literacy. What I don't know if there's any comparative work looking at that issue within the school system, within the pupils, and that would be an absolutely fascinating thing to do. So if anyone wants to do that with us and national um, numeracy, I'm up for it. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more comments? Um, uh, we'll start, start with uh, Maggie and then Maggie at the front. Thank you. Um, nobody said this, so I think I should say, it, which of course is that oral language is the foundation for um, learning to read. And when kids come to school, there are two factors which are going to predict their risk of reading problems. One is their language, uh, their poor language, and the second is if they're family at family risk of reading problems. These two things are, are strongly connected, connected to, uh, of course, social disadvantage. I have a specific question though, which is that of those children who are at risk, who um, are put into a highly structured phonics curriculum, which I absolutely endorse, they're also being required only to read decoding texts by the national curriculum. So I'd like to ask the panel what their view is about that. Is it a good thing or should we be widening reading experience straight away? <laughs> um, I completely agree. So we, um, on entry to um, early years, we are currently, as a research school, we are in partnership with RSC Cambridge de developing, and we're in the middle of de delivering a RSC into action um, 
course for early years and key stage one practitioners to ensure that early language development is at the forefront of teaching. Um, in terms of reading, um, we, as it says in the um, preparing for literacy in the key stage one uh, literacy guidance report from the EEF, that we do have to ensure that we are focusing on book talk. So teachers modeling um, all of those skills, but just having a lovely time of reading with the children, as well as developing the skill of reading at the same time. So um, that that is given equal weighting um, at, at our school and with lots of schools that we work with, because we use the best bets from the EEF to kind of make sure that that's at the forefront of our decision making around early reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um... Thanks. Is that on? Yeah. One of the things I noticed that was a kind of commonality across the talks was that there was a lot of emphasis and, and achievement on delivering feasible and acceptable interventions. But what we saw across the board was that these interventions didn't have very much effectiveness. So they had either no or very small um, outcome measures. And I, I guess I, you know, ideally we want that sweet spot of something that really works and something that's feasible. But you know, if you do have an intervention, one, one of the things that struck me about Sarah's talk is, is the qualitative evidence from teachers about just how intense this intervention was, how it took time out of the curriculum, which is already very packed. So I just wanted some insight as to you know, how big does an effect have to be to want to bring it into the classroom and, and take away from other types of activities. I guess I'll just start by saying that I guess with Sarah's work, it's such early days and it was a um, six week uh, intervention and uh, very early kind of indications of um, effects on reading um, motivation and engagement and, and to get any sort of effect on attainment you would you would you would imagine that would build over time so I think um, the jury's out on quite whether that will have a low effect really. but um, I'll let the else chip in who wants to do Uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a balancing act to be had between um, what might be effective in idealised circumstances and what the evidence might suggest from carefully controlled studies and what's actually going to work in practice. And we do need to balance, Cathy, as Cathy says, we do need to balance very carefully about what's effect between what's effective and also what's going to be feasible and acceptable in school. Um, my tuppence worth would really just be that we're very early in the journey of trying to balance all of those things and create the right research approaches to make sure that we can create that right balance. Um, and I think that Sarah's work in the Love to Read programme really, really does exemplify how we might move forward with that and kind of um, sets the scene for how we might do that. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, I think we do need to make sure that things are not only going to be, we not only think they're going to be effective in theory, but that they are effective in practice before we affect big changes in schools. I think that is a really important um, point. And I think for that reason, when I work with schools, my first um, port of call is always to understand what they are already doing. And in the absence of really good evidence of effectiveness, feasibility and acceptability, uh, try and tweak what they're already doing and frame what they're doing with the kinds of um, approaches to seeing whether it's had an impact and how it's working in the school rather than saying you should be doing something completely different because we don't necessarily know what that should be. Um, so I think um, that's that's where we should be going next is try and design the right kind of research that allows us to balance those three things. Um, Alice hasn't been waving at me, so I assume there's nothing. OK, but I just wanted to double check. I'm not ignoring uh, our online audience. Um, I think we've probably got time. For, I know we're a little overrun, but maybe we'll take two more questions and then um, and, then, and then stop. Um, so. Um, I wanted to say first how interesting I found all of this, what super speak talk, talks we've had. Um, but specifically to come back to Maggie's comments, um, I just should should say that all books are decodable. Every book is decodable if you can decode it. And so um, my point would be is that children are required to read books that they can decode. Um, 
uh, that it's not restricted to books that are that are called decodable books. It's books that they can decode. And I really liked um, Hayden's comments that when they can't decode, for, if, if, if I'm putting it correctly, when they can't decode very much, lots and lots of work around oral development and reading to children will compensate to the fact that they're not able to read very much. So sorry, it was more a comment than a question. Um, I think my, um, let's let the Director of Education at the Nuffield Foundation have a word too, so, otherwise I'll be in trouble. Yeah, I, do, I mean, just pulling together a couple of the points that have been made, it seems to me that um, the, the focus on interventions here may be a bit of a red herring um, in that we're talking, I think, about teaching practice more generally and about priorities within what goes on in schools and in the curriculum. Um, and with that in mind, I was thinking about, you know, Sarah, Sarah's intervention is about uh, the ways the ways that schools operate in in general. And it's not just the responsibility of schools. And I guess that's leads leads to my question, which is probably aimed at Jonathan, which is about, you know, who, who else can support schools in this endeavor? Because if you put this all on on schools, it's just too much, too much pressure. And I'm thinking about you know, the media. I'm thinking about library services. Obviously, they are deprioritized themselves, but they're compensating for depleted, <laughs> depleted book supplies in schools. Uh, but they themselves have, you know, limited hours. They have um, the, the partnerships that they're able to do with schools are, are more limited by their staff shortages and so on. And then you've got, you know, games producers. The fact that social media is um, inherently using the written text, which is potentially a really good thing. So, wanted to hear a little bit more about how those outside of the school system can support initiatives like uh, I what, what, what Sarah's talking about, which is obviously potentially really powerful. And you've answered your own question absolutely brilliantly. Um, I mean, the, in, in the past decade, we've been experimenting and working in different ways in 17 communities in the UK, where there is a strong relationship between social background and literacy, looking at a particular theme in each of those places and grouping together for a minimum of a decade partnership which will work collaboratively in and using collective impact methodology specific methodology around partnership working in the locality as a framework for that and you know, in, in Middlesbrough um, the, 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 the theme has been speech language communication and uh, in early years um, and you know, the, 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 the partnerships have obviously been health but have also been social housing they've included obviously the link between um, premature birth and language development is, is, a, is a factor so the premature baby unit has become a, as well as um, in terms of engaging fathers um, Middlesbrough football club um, so you know, a, a multi-agency grouping which actually but with but I mean the, 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 what we applied as I said was actually a very specific partnership methodology so rather than just bunging a load of stuff at it and hoping something sticks it, the, a framework which actually has a very specific aim at heart which is in in Bradford um, uh, key stage three attitudes around reading and the, and the skills associated with reading in in um, in uh, as I say in um, Middlesbrough um, early speech language and communication different theme in each place assembling partners which are stakeholders in the culture of reading and in service provision and also in direct interfaces as trusted messengers to parents who we can use and then having a sustained approach so not trying to do it in two three four years but actually saying this is an intergenerational and, and a cultural thing we're trying to affect Therefore, actually, we need to get under the skin. And the evaluations have been utterly, utterly fascinating. And, you know, as I say, it's the, it's the, it's the levers which exist outside the direct school space which can sometimes produce strongest impact in the long run on school attainment. But it's only through working in a different way that you can actually begin to... to, to, to Thank you very much. Um, we have one quick comment from the back, um, and then I think we'll need to wrap up. I did just want to mention the English Hub programme, because I am actually chair of the English Hub Council, so I do want to get our two pennyworth in as well. Um, so we've talked a lot about the research schools, but the English Hubs are supporting massively, and we have to get away from the fact that we, we think that they're all about phonics. They're not. There are three aims. So one of the, those aims is to get all our schools in England, obviously using a validated programme well. 
But that sits within the other two aims. And one of those aims is what we've talked a lot about today, which is the wider reading, reading for pleasure, the will, and wanting to keep children wanting to read. And the other one is early language. So at the moment, we're our particular hub up in the Northwest is supporting over 100 schools. So there's a massive amount of funding. Most of it still, unfortunately, out of, don't quote me on that, the minister wants it mostly di uh, directed at um, validating programmes, SSPs. But we also do an awful lot of work in those other two areas. And what we're trying to feed back at the moment is the outcomes of the work we've been doing over the last three to four years, which is all very well getting children to read very, very quickly and decode. But the issue is, is that they start to stall at the beginning of year two with their reading fluency. And of course, the gap starts to widen because of how much reading they're getting at home or not and how much you can actually put into the curriculum. So that is really where we're at, which is why the only really way we've had to do it serving in Blackpool in high disadvantage is if you know children aren't reading at home, you've got to give them all those reading opportunities within school. And the only way you can do that is to absolutely drench your curriculum with, with books. And we're fortunate that we've been able to do that. So what's happening at the moment is schools that are on this journey are realising that when they get to this year two and they've got to really develop fluency and word knowledge and everything else, the only way they can do that is to start to change how they deliver the curriculum. So what we're finding is real changes in the pedagogy. Um, and actually in our year five and year six, if you came, and I mentioned before, but today I've mentioned it, it's almost starting to resemble what year seven looks like. And that's what it should be, which is about children being more independent and being able to use the, the digital literacy as well, has to go alongside this as well. So there's lots of things happening and it's great. I came along today, I was in, reminded to come along to see all this research and I'm, I'm going to take so much of it away. But we do need to join up um, because I say I'm working in the schools and you're doing all this great research. So um, I've got loads of ideas, but um, that's that's really what that partnership needs to be. But I just wanted to come back because obviously the National Literary Trust and Nuffield, they're, they're doing great jobs of getting books into school. But it's it's got to be more systematic. It's got to be more joined up. Uh, and that's what we're hopefully working all together on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, well, today was, was an endeavour um, to, to join some of these conversations up and make sure that we are thinking about reading um, in a less fragmented way, not just decoding vocabulary comprehension separately, but thinking about some of the connections and these things in the round. And also, as, as other people have mentioned, uh, looking at primary through into the early secondary as well. It's not just a primary job to, um, to produce a, a cohort of children who are, are strong readers as, as, as children and adults. Um, so on, on that note, I'd like to thank you, um, thanks, thanks firstly to the panel for um, your brilliant insights. Um, thank you to our presenters earlier, and thank you very much um, to everybody who's attended and asked such uh, thought-provoking questions. Really appreciate you coming and, and hearing and, and getting, getting your, your thoughts on, on the work that we funded.